Yeah, so welcome everyone here and welcome to those who are joining us today through one of our social media channels today or at some later time. My name is Jan Rückemeyer, and besides being one of the two founders of Diagnosis and Minds, I'm teaching New Testament at the University at Bonn, um, New Testament in its Greek Roman context. Today um, is our second session with Mark Turner, who is still a professor of cognitive science at Weapon <laughs> Reserve University. Though, of course, one this hope. is only my perception of him, because others might know him better as the husband of a well-known or famous author for young adult literature. Um, while Mark's lecture yesterday um, was intended to bridge the gap between his own discipline and the New Testament, but also uh, to uh, narratives in general, um, the idea of today's workshop, as we call it, is that we can introduce our own research, as we are scholars from a variety from different disciplines, and we can introduce our own research and discuss it with Mark. So please don't hesitate to comment on anything or raise any question relevant for you, no matter whether you're a student, a junior scholar, or a senior scholar. And um, I will come up with a micro so you can ask a question. And um, please um, introduce yourself with a few words before asking a question. So the floor is open. Hi, everybody. So this is the best part of the visit, where, where I get to find out what you're working on. Because then I just get to take your ideas, and the next place I go to talk, I say, well, I met somebody at the University of St. Andrews who was working on this and that and the other. And we connect up the world, and science moves forward an inch. So. We're interested to know what you're working on and what kind of connection you're looking for. We should perhaps start with either Alicia. Uh, would you like to be on the spot or I can start? Aha. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Elijah. Yes. Eli's coming. There used to be a song. <laughs> Eli's coming. Um, hi, so I'm, I'm Alicia Hine. I'm uh, student in Hebrew Bible here at St. Andrews, um, working on the text about Elijah. So by definition, those are quite broad. There's, you spend from first and second Kings, uh, Malachi, numerous second temple texts, and then well into the New Testament as well. Um, I'm also, I'm interested in how the later texts about Elijah take up the image that's developed in the earlier ones. Um, so in that is obviously some sense of community memory, community identity, um, and how that develops through time as reflected in the text of the community. So based on um, based on the article that that you distributed and based on the the lecture Thanks for reading, by the way. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Um, I'm wondering how how do some of these you know, cognitive blends develop at a group level, at a community level, a cultural level. Um, so I'm looking specifically at the possibility of Elijah, in my case, being portrayed in the texts of the community as representative of the community. So you talked about um, compressing a mass number of people into a single kind of categorical heading, and you also in your article talked about, you know, example of say a political cartoon exactly. where people see an image that communicates something completely different from what it is on the surface level and yet they all understand what it's meant to communicate. So how how does that kind of group understanding and group cognition develop? Are there certain criteria that need to be in place in a community for that to happen? Um, certain you know common experiences or things like that? Thank you. So I'm I'm just uh floored by the depth of uh, the questions that I'm getting here. I'm very impressed either with your backgrounds or the training you've gotten here. Um, that these are extremely daunting questions. And what I would say is that cognitive science is really a, uh, an embryonic discipline. We understand much less 
about how human beings think than our cultures tell us. Uh, human beings evolutionarily must succeed. They must be able to operate. And this means that you need meaning that you can engage with. Hi, I am here. I am getting a resource. I am dealing with this person. This is my child. You, you have to be able to operate. This is what the human mind does. It creates meaning. And interestingly, very confusingly, a role for you in the meaning. Now that's extremely remarkable. As I said yesterday, I look extremely different and am extremely different. So we're talking about identity through this whole rambling. I, I, there's a through line here for me. I'm trying to connect it to you. But we're talking about identity and particular individual identity. I look very different from, I mean, am wildly different from the baby that came out of my mother in 1954. But the whole world wants to establish that there is a personal identity here. So we use an enormous amount of linguistic real estate. We give names. Now, of course, it seems obvious that we give names. But that's weird. You know, the plant world doesn't have names. We give names to the plant world. Remember Genesis and, you know, naming off all the... We're the ones who give the names. It is true that dolphins have what are called signature whistles. And there's the recognition, this is a conspecific, this is Kim. Good to be able to recognize, you understand that you really are the strangest thing in the universe on personal identity. If you were a bunch of chimpanzees, you would not be sitting like this. Not just because they don't sit in lecture halls and listen to boring lectures. You would not be willing to be this close to each other because you are not Kim. Chimpanzees do not gather this closely in the presence of anything except very close kin, which they can recognize. You would be screaming, fighting with each other, throwing feces, trying to get out of the window. There's a great book called In the Company of Strangers. You are sitting here. Believe me, that is weird. You know you're not closely related to each other, but that's fine. So other species can kind of recognize him, but these, and there are kinds of memory connected to sensory perception. So when Odysseus comes home after 20 years, maybe it's true the dog could recognize the smell of Odysseus. They're domesticated for it. And the smell of a dog, you just, I mean, the, the, the dog's whole factory ability is off. I mean, it's a miracle. You can't believe what dogs can smell at what distance. They're really, really evolved for that. But this thing of a lifelong identity, where you, you remember the blue shoes you had when you were three, you say to yourself, oh, I last time I did this 20 years ago, you know, from uh, it, it went this way, so I don't think I'll do that again. But now uh, I remember this other case when it, that other person did it and it worked. So I'll do what she did. And now you're blending. This seems so automatic to you. It's like, what is he talking about? Is he insane? That, you know, a kid can do it. That's true. You're masters of things like personal identity. And culture gives us little cartoons. Hi, you know, this is who I am. But on the scientific side of, the side of trying to figure out how you form conceptions of identity and how they last and how you compress over time and how you can blend yourself with other people and now in the blend imitate them in various kinds of ways. So one of the things that you'll often find among graduate students is they perform in certain ways that are like their professor. And they don't really realize they're doing it, but you can look at it and pick it out. Ah, 
That's Mary's students. That's what Mary would do, right? But these these things are just you know miraculous for human beings. And they've been picked out forever. You know, Aristotle says human beings are the most imitative of all. And you really are the human ability to pick up on the genetic. It's not just that you look at them and you say, ah, she's got Aunt Mary's eyes, but she's also got Aunt Mary's gestures because she's picked, and those are ontogenetic. They did, those did not come with a, a developmental evolutionary suite. Those are things that they picked up in real time. And it's very frequently the case that if you want to succeed in something, you just move into the sphere where you're now blending yourself with that other person who knows how to do things. You even like to watch mathematicians and they will like move the way they're, and this has made people enormously capable. But the science, the psychological science of this is almost non-existent, right? What's a personality? Where does it get it? So very, very easy for us to do, just like language almost no conscious understanding. We can't look into it. We can't, in the same way you can't look into how you see. You can just get the product. There's a visual field, but you can't look into this. Okay, so we can talk about this for hours, but now let's go, let's go to your point. I'm talking about the complexity of just having a personal identity or constructing a personal identity for the other person. And you can do that partly by blending yourself with other people, but also movies, stories. One of the great re reasons for having fiction is it gives you content, it gives you stuff. Remember I said this bit about blending with what's, what's not here, blending with what's not you, blending with what's not even real. It seems to be a, an enormous barrier for all other species, because if they're in stark conflict, causal, intentional structure, participant roles, things like that, human beings have no trouble. They say if Clinton were the Titanic, the iceberg would sink. And so now Bill Clinton is a Titanic and political things are icebergs. That one you can see. But just like if I say, if I were my brother-in-law, um, I'd be miserable because my brother-in-law is a stockbroker in San Francisco, you see. And suppose I'm imagining, hey, would I like to be a stockbroker? It's a little late now, but yeah, I could get into it. I got some talent, yeah, I could work it out, old dog. But wait, then I realize my brother-in-law lives in San Francisco. The market opens uh, at nine Eastern time. That means it opens at six o'clock Pacific time in the United States, because we have all those time zones. That means he has to be up at five o'clock in the morning if he's going to deal with real money. Now I'm a night owl, always have been. Stay up all night. Most of the work I do is at two o'clock in the morning. Right? If I see five o'clock, it's because I'm still up. <laughs> okay. okay, so the idea of getting up at five o'clock in the morning to be ready to work at six is every day that's, okay. So if I were my, my brother-in-law, I'd be miserable. And what I'm interested in here is blending me, my dispositions, with his occupation. And notice the complexity of this. Nobody here thinks that if I, when I say, if I were my brother-in-law in this context, because I've set up this context, that I would be married to his wife. <coughs> but why not? I'm my brother-in-law, I have his occupation, but you didn't say, okay, then I have a different, my writer wife. Okay, <clears throat> my brother-in-law's sister is my wife, right? Now, if I'm my brother-in-law, does this mean I'm married to my sister?
project your intentions to mother. And so mother must be likely that I'm clearly speaking of a later developmental state. Now, the last question on metaphor, notice she has three cosmic questions. <laughs> I mean, really, come on, uh, 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 think about it. Uh, top down, bottom up, processing the development of the human mind in the sense of identity and our metaphor. Okay. We have, a, human beings are models. We have a word, now. And strangely, we think if we have a word for it, it exists. So dog, dog is actually a role, right? Interestingly, we say, you know, uh, 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 dinosaurs turned into birds, bears, hibernate. Why? Okay, we are in the world is dog. Do I see dog? I mean, if a dog came in here, I'm not seeing dog. You can't see the category in the world. It's an invention. It's an it's an inference. You may have certain categories that you recognize instinctively, like the snake freaks you right out. But all the others you had to come up with. Right? Well, it, it, maybe there are no metaphors, but wait, we respond to this, we say that. So I know, come on, Professor Turner, I know that. that it, 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 Juliet is the sun and rises out of the metaphor. Right, okay, you have a response to something, you say this is a, this is a metaphor. Okay, I have to account for that response. I have an article called Figure. You can find it on my website. It's very long. It's like 10, it's 15,000 words. It's a chapter. It's largely um, looks at ancient sources in the analysis of language and metaphor, pointing out that cognitive linguists are largely re asking questions that have been asked before, but trying to answer them with different methods. Cognitive linguistics often doesn't realize that. Okay. And even worse, when we have a word for it, we think it exists in the world. And often, if the word has something to do with mentality, we think there must be a process that is that thing. So we talk about metaphoric thinking or the process of metaphor, right? Remember what I said about uh, uh, Michael Anderson, that maybe we've got these categories. Are there metaphors? Is there a process of metaphor? That's one of the things that science is currently trying to investigate. My view, an embryonic view that's gone through a lot of development, it developed when I met Chief Fournier and did meet but started working with him because I gave a talk at Ron Lanneker's house and we started working on this together. Is that in fact there are a lot of things that people think of mentally that are more related in their process than we realize. So framing. We say Paul is the father of Mary. That just looks like framing. Categorization. This is a dog. Right? Metaphor. All the kinds of imaginative mashups that are clearly not metaphoric. All the kinds of things that feel metaphoric, but you're not projecting inferences from the source, contrary to metaphor theory. If I say, if Clinton were the Titanic, the iceberg would sink. The one thing you know about the Titanic is it didn't sink. And you know, icebergs can't sink because they're ice and less dense than water than be submerged, but they can Okay, the causality and all the inferences are coming from the political space, not, not the source. So what I would say for all of these questions, and I know this might be disappointing, but for all of these questions, like how we process, um, how we develop, and how we connect two things metaphorically, I'd say lots of progress has been made in the last 40 years. It's being made now. And I revere uh, those who have made this process. But we understand much less about this than science and philosophy and psychology would like to pretend. And I think that's partly the conditioning of constructing your personal identity as a triumphant researcher who is in the academy and going to do uh, great things. And maybe the real answers to these things will come in part from your investigations. You know, if you push science forward uh, another inch. So we can be inspired by Wittgenstein. We can be inspired by Aristotle on metaphor. Uh, we can be inspired by uh, people who talk about how you construct a concept by cutting and pasting either the empiricist or the gestalt. We can be inspired by those things. But let us not 
subscribe to their authority. They were trying to push things forward, and so we are. And you're really asking questions to which most of the answers are not. Done. Okay. Does anybody have a, a non spacious and death defying uh, <laughs> question? Well, I have four, five more uh, questions actually on my, okay. on my list. Uh, I'll try to take them off. Yeah. We've been here for, we got a lot of time. We've been here 45 time. minutes. Yeah, yeah. We're fine. But five more questions. The sure. next one is uh, from, from Eric, who, by the way, is in charge of our social media channels. Uh, Thank you for all your work. For various reasons. Uh, yeah. But now, Thank you for all your work. It's uh, really an amazing platform. Yeah, uh, macro microphone, microphone, microphone. Thank you. All right, so thank you so much for the uh it takes about 30 seconds to tick up. Check, check. There we go. All right. So thanks so much for the lecture last night and the workshop and all the all of you are bringing to mind regarding our presentation narrative. I'm finding it. Uh, really interesting because uh, for me, uh, cognitive science is just not the approach that I'm familiar with. So this is like a whirlwind introduction to these approaches to attention narrative. But I'm at, uh, my name is Eric, and I'm working on a second year uh, PhD. My project is um, interdisciplinary between New Testament, biblical studies, and classics. And so um, the question I'm asking is how imperial period authors, really the first, second, third century, writing in primarily Greek, but also in Latin, would use right. narrative to um, express philosophical premises. And so, and, and most of the narratives I'm looking at are largely fictional. And then uh, the question I'm asking, the, you know, is the kind of the point of question, is how am I looking at those narratives help us understand how the Gospel of John specifically tells the story of Jesus the way that it does? A lot John of is always, I mean, the cosmic, spacious, and death. John is always the hard one, the, the yeah. eagle that's flying it. Yeah. I mean, this is meat and not milk. You don't get let people <laughs> give readings on John until. <laughs> Okay, that's all right. I'll solve all of John right here. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> so, so for me, I'm from, I came to this subject for this topic with literary interests. So that's really kind of my default approach is a literary approach to ancient narratives. And uh, I found as I've worked in it that uh, part of what becomes thorny, if not like a complete quagmire that you get stuck in, are questions about things like authorial intentionality. And trying to reconstruct the, the um, psychology of the author or the psychology of the reader, and how can you know that an author was intentionally using a certain genre or certain literary devices, etc. And I think that, especially in the lecture last night, thinking about like the um, functions of blending and the function of uh, classic joint attention, it seems to me like it might help. Uh, push these kind of considerations forward, pass some of these things that become sticking points. So kind of the question I'm asking that I'd like you to speak on candidly, what can you say about how do you speak to the idea that from a reader's perspective or even from an author's perspective, that blending is something that can happen both intentionally or unintentionally. And that an author might invite a reader into this classic form of attention, both intentionally or unintentionally. And um, with those things in mind, uh, is it, and I think you really touched on this, building off of Austin's question on metaphor, um, do we get stuck around these topics when we talk about um, metaphor or genre or et cetera, et cetera, because of the fact that we categorize them as these things and this is what it looks like. And if the author's doing this and the reader's reading that, then they must understand it the way we understand it. But in actuality, that's a form, but the function is blending, and the function is um, this I think I'll just have a little light on right here. Uh, uh, oh, yep. I think I've got the question. Brilliant question. Uh, again, my answers are to these sorts of things are all likely to be disappointing in the sense that I ask people to move back and rethink premises. 
so let's talk a little bit about how you can know. All right. So here we go on how a human being can know what somebody else is thinking. It doesn't feel this way to us, but in fact, you have no direct access to any mind but your own. Nothing. All indications that there is thought there in the fourth row are indirect. They are inferential. They must be. The only thing that's happening right now, as I said yesterday, when you're, you're dealing with everybody in this room, all these other minds, is a few photons are hitting your redness and a few longitudinal waves are hitting your ear. Maybe there's a little olfactory. What about the sense of context? You said this yeah, yeah, could, it's the same sort of thing. Where do you get the sense of context? Like I'm, I'm yes, why do, I, why do I think that this is a lecture hall and somebody is sitting here? Do I see it? Does the world come label? No. Well, I feel it. You feel it. You, it. you feel it. And you have this sense that you know this, right? And I can see that you feel this. But in fact, that's an inference because I can't see your thinking, right? I only thing that's happening is the only, perceptually, the only thing that is happening is some photons are hitting my retina and some longitudinal waves are hitting my ear. And I have no trouble constructing an identity for you. I have no trouble thinking that you believe certain things. In fact, if you didn't behave in certain ways that would indicate that you did believe that this is a lecture hall in this context, I would think that you were insane and I would participate with our peers. Maybe you're having a stroke. And I, I construct all of this and the point is, how do I do that? How does anybody do this? And I maintain there is no direct access to anybody else's thought, it's inferential. I can't see your thoughts. I, if, I, if I do brain imaging, which by the way, guys, I teach this stuff, is very blunt, is not at all refined. It's still inferential. What am I seeing? This, this colors, this is blood flow. Is it's based fact? on your experience, right? It's based yeah. on my experience and my sense of what I've got, but my experience after a certain point, because these things bootstrap each other. They all work together. It's not like there's the scaffolding and the painting, and then we take the scaffolding away. The scaffolding is the painting, is the scaffolding, is the, you build this up in a lifetime. And some of my experience comes from you. I have now met you, and I have heard what you said. And the person said, well, what about context? I feel it. And now that's part of my experience. So my own sense of myself gets informed by the fact that I've had experience with my construction of yourself, right? So this rare, and you see little kids, why, why can babies not remember things, right? And later on, can you remember when you were six months old? Why not? Why not? Well, it might just be that you hadn't built enough of a conceptual matrix to pigeonhole things in. It might have been for early stages, you didn't have a sense of self. You didn't. So the developmental questions here are very, very hard. Okay, but back to, uh, back to knowing what somebody, I can't know, and here's the point, human beings are not built for truth. Evolution doesn't care about truth unless it impacts your differential fitness. What you're built for is to be fit, to succeed in some ways. It's fine for memory to be a sunny day if altering memory helps you move forward. Uh, so here's a little example. I've given it before. Um, imagine it's Scotland, you get right up. Imagine times when you've been miserably cold to the bone. Okay, now remember that moment. You can remember that you were cold to the bone, but you cannot recreate the experience. You cannot now be miserably cold to the bone. Why? Because remember, evolution doesn't want you to have a memory that's accurate. It wants you to have a memory that helps you succeed. So remembering to avoid that because you've got cold to the bone is useful. 
re re reactivate being cold of the bone is not. Now, sometimes you remember, wait a minute, when I did this last time, I, I got shamed, I got embarrassed. And now you see the scene again and you start to feel the shame. And then you know, in that case, you can reactivate the shame and the diffidence and so on, right? So what you're built to produce here is not driven so much by truth as success. That's, that's how evolution works. And you can get in a cul-de-sac and it's not all progress. You can go backward. We can talk about evolutionary all the time. So now the only thing you can do in dealing with other people is try to imagine minds for them. And you're in a story with this person. You know, Alicia here is going to send me her dissertation on Elijah. We talked about this and we had an interaction. Well, okay, now I'm, I've got a way to go forward. But that depends upon my having a sense of, of my having construction for at least a certain kind of intentions. I can think she might really want to. Boy, it's fun to talk to this guy. She might think, well, he showed up and he was the speaker, so I had to be nice and I'll tell him he can have my dissertation on Elijah, even though I know he's much too ignorant to have anything interesting. That could have been, right? I don't think so. But it, that could have been, and I'm constantly doing this. And this is for Alicia, who's right here. We have this conversation. I can ask her questions and stuff. Yeah. Best I can do is try to put things forward. And we've all done that. And then later on, realize, wow, I really did that wrong. When that barista was smiling at me, that's just what she does to customers. She wasn't smiling at me. I've had to explain this. <laughs> Wait, I'm from Southern California, right? And like in the shops in the 1960s, people are walking around in almost nothing, right? Almost nothing. Some of them are really beautiful. And the East Coast relatives would come as tourists and I, I hold on, wait, that doesn't mean what you think it means, right? That's just, well, that's, that's not the way that it's interpreted here, but you do your best. And okay, now let's move to somebody you don't know. Um, you, you have no experience of them, whatever. You may not even know who the person is, but you construct the idea, blended classic joint attention. Somebody was behind this. And the best you can do is try to imagine what can be going on here. And one way to do it is to say people have intentions. They perform acts with intentions. This person, somebody wrote this, or some group of people wrote this, or composed it, and then the, the Homeri die, and then the scribes wrote it down, or something. And they had some intentions. What could those intentions have been? Well, they might want to draw my attention to it. Now, when you think about it, they have a lot of reasons to hide some of their intentions. Maybe the intention was to make money. Maybe the intention was to shame their opponent. Maybe the, but we constantly put expressions out in order to get people to make assumptions about our intentions. It's cognitive engineering. We are trying to manipulate their interpretation of our intentions. And, um, and we all know this is true. It can be the same of the writer. The writer writing to Theophilus, that could, but maybe there was no Theophilus. That was just a ruse so to put you in the position of overhearing. This, like the earliest novels were all overhearing of supposedly personal letters, but they were all fictional, okay? So the best you can do in these circumstances is to come up with your inferences and your assertions about what's going on here. And these things are highly contested. I mean, the new critics basically thought this is, forget it. You're not gonna get anywhere. We're sitting around arguing about the author's intentions. Um, but there have been lots of other sorts of things, uh, uh, calling all this sort of stuff in question. What I would say is from a cognitive point of view, uh, the best you can do is look at how human beings interpret. It's reasonable that you th would think that these texts had intentions behind them, but we can debate about what those intentions might be. And consciousness is a thin little read, it's very well established that people uh, misremember, 
They think they have intentions when they don't. They think they've learned when they haven't that your construction of what's going on with you and others is often quite wrong as far as veracity, but it might be very successful. It's, it's, it's helping you out. And that can be true of the writer. Now notice, by the way, on the blended classic joint attention, you see a landscape and there's a, a statue over there and there's a place for you to sit. You don't know who designed this and they don't know you. But your way of making sense of this is this is not a natural phenomenon. The world did not make this. That person put that there so that I would think that I could sit here and socialize with my college friends. And what are they doing? They're thinking about my future. They were college students here. And I bet if I go over to that tab table in the United States, every, all the money is private. <coughs> um, everything is new. If I go over to that table, it's going to be a little plaque. And it's going to say gift of blah, blah, or the class of night. So somebody had the idea to put this here for me because they're blending themselves. So I used to be a dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And, that, and that's everything, dance, theology, philosophy, physics, math, the whole thing. And to do that, you have to raise a lot of money in the United States. And so we perform what we call wallet You go meet alumni, rich alumni, and the easiest sell. See, these people don't have discretionary time, but they have discretionary money. And people want to construct meaning in their lives, and they give money. And the easiest sell is money to help someone who's in the category that they were in, because they lead this life. So they endow with fellowships, they endow with scholarships, they endow with the picnic benches where you can sit. Then there'd be a little plaque there. Now, I see that from afar, and I don't know these people, but I have these stories, these roles, these concepts, and I think. This is blended classic joint attention. This was set up for some, by somebody as cognitive engineering to get me to attend to and think certain things. And that can be false or it could be imaginary. We can look at the clouds and think that the divine is sending us signals. We can look at the way the birds fly, augury, and we can say, ah, the gods are telling us not to invade, right? We can horrificate the entrails of something and tell us, no, the signs are not propitious. In all those cases, it's blended classic joint attention where the other side is the divine that's communicating through you intentionally. I mean, this was cognitively injured. That bird flew that way because somebody wants me to see this kind of thing. Now, this can sound um, dismissive, but it isn't at all. You can't have direct access to the mind or the intentions of an author from the Imperial. Okay, let's just take something a little later, like Marcus Aurelius. You read the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, there are all these theories, all these narratives, where he's, and he's trying to, he's, he's quite explicitly trying to get you to think certain things. And he's telling you these stories, and, you, and what you're doing there, although it often seems as if you can step right in, what you're doing there is using all of these powers, mainly story and blending, to try to figure out the mind of, an, of another person or a group of people or of a tradition in order to get you to respond in certain ways. One of the problems with this is Marcus Aurelius did not know about the University of St. Andrews in 2022. So back to the Elijah bit. The way we interpret these things is going to depend upon what stories and roles we elaborate. And that's one of the reasons that the scholar says, listen, wait a minute, you have to understand back uh, in imperial stories, the audience was aware of this kind of story and you're not. So you don't realize that this is a reference to that kind of thing. Okay, next. Okay, as you actually raised your hand at the very beginning, do you want to follow up on your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so a little context, my name is Braulio Ribeiro, I'm uh, here, I have passed like to experiment claim, so I was a student of linguistics, I was a linguistic researcher for phonology. So sure. I'm not very... Oh, but the phonology is one of the areas where we're actually making success. So, so in my, my study here deals with uh, Brazilian nation formations and land, 
in history of religion and anthropology, etc. I go to Brazil all the time. I'm going to be speaking at the Brazilian International Cognitive Science Society of the Week. I, I love well, the, the, cognitive science in Brazil is yeah, really yeah. very advanced. It is making progress, yes. So, so my question is, Brazil spoke a different language than Portuguese for almost 300 years in any other region. Yeah, before there was a Brazil. No, 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 there was land, but we didn't call it Brazil. They spoke a different language before any. No, I'm, I'm talking about after the, the Europeans. Okay. Started. Yes, so there were speakers. Of up to the 1900s. Sure. Okay, so, so in several regions, and the language still alive, uh, sure. spoken by a few hundred thousand. Amerindian languages all over Brazil. Yes, and this specific language that's called Yangatu, mm -hmm. uh, there was the, the language that. So what what my question is? So this language was widely spoken, and uh, so it took like maybe two three generations to transition to Portuguese yeah. in most of the regions, and and to make the the country almost monolingual into Portuguese after the a decree that forbade the the, the language yeah, yeah. to be spoken in, in 1757. And so my question is. How and, and and of course, there's all kinds of uh, historic uh, studies that can be done. Study of lexicon, the borrowed the lexicon shiftings in, in morphology and, and uh, syntaxes that were influenced by Yangatu, the original language. But I want to go beyond and find the shadow, the ghost, the cognitive ghost of that language that still can be found. In the Portuguese and in the way we behave as Brazilians. So, would do you have any guidance or kind of tool? Can I apply mental spaces? I know you have several um, unfoldings of your theory, so I'm curious. Another <laughs> language descent and cultural development. Okay. Um, here's a central fact. Uh, that we often don't deal with in talking about the mind. And that is that people are mortal. They die. This is crucial. It might be the most crucial fact about human development. As you go on to genetically through the life course and develop various mental abilities and invent new linguistic constructions, right? that brain will die. And before writing, there was still the question of how can you pass things on? This is a very hard question because if you can't get it into the minds of the generation that's just been born, then it does. It's gone. Cognitively, you have to somehow make this thing survive. So you're all working on texts in the New Testament. The reason you're working on texts in the New Testament is all those people are dead. If Jesus could just walk right in here with Elijah and Abraham, and we could just talk to them, okay, but that's not what happens. They die. So culture, and it's amazing that there can be culture. We take it for granted that there are all these cultural differences. That's the scientific problem to explain. How can there be culture? I mean, as I say, just a great ape. The other great apes don't have anything like it. I can talk to you about the kinds of cultural inventions they have, how few they are, what the constraints of them are. Human beings are just like a miracle off the chart. You can develop culture. Culture spends most of its time dealing with the fact of mortality, trying to find ways to move, to move it on. Without that basic fact, scripture and New Testament and passing things on and spreading the good news. And these, these would they look completely different. We know that language has changed and language change is a big field. How can languages change, right? There are these dead languages. I never thought, by the way, Israel was going to be able to bring people back because most attempts to bring back a dead language die. And my Israeli linguist friends say, listen, it never really died. In fact, we've had the sources for this. Okay. 
language has changed. English has only been around, you know, what, 1400 years before at German, you chase it all back to Indo-European. How do they change? Well, as you know, because you're trained in linguistics, the constraints in language change are very sharp, especially phonology, but also syntax. Once a language makes a certain kind of decision, it's path dependent and you can't roll it back. So in English, we have double verb causative constructions. I made Paul laugh, where the agent who performs the caused action goes between the verbs. I made Paul cry. Um, in French, these things are immensely complicated. I've got a 12,000 word article on this. Uh, in French, all the clinics and the reflexes go in very different places. Only a native speaker can put it right. Um, but at the gross level, the agent of the caused action in fact goes after both of the verbs, right? Je fais rire Paul. I made Paul cry. Once it is, you can do it either way. But once, the, once you make this decision, then it's path dependent. It gets entrenched. Can't go back. Very, very, very hard to go back. You get this thing into the kid's head, and then that's what they've got. Now, there are survivals, and you can pick things up. So I've learned a lot of languages, sort of. Really, all of them might speak in English. Um, uh, I'm a monoglot despite the fact that I try to read all these other things. You can pick things up and put them in. And some things survive. Some things actually survive through language. So the dialectologists who look at phonology also, also have looked like anthropologists, linguistic anthropologists have little lists of certain kinds of stories or certain kinds of roles that survive that managed to percolate through. So, for example, I was raised in the American uh, Pacific Coast and a little bit in the American Southwest. So there's this character, Coco Pele. I'm highly familiar with the stories of Coco Pele. I am not an Acoma Pueblo Indian or uh, not. I know a lot of things about the Sonoran district of Mexico because I was raised in San Diego. Half of my friends were essentially speakers of Mexican, right? which I mean a Sonoran dialect. So when I go to Spain and try to speak Spanish, my, my Spanish friends, Castilian and uh, Andalusian, make fun of me because they say, Mark, you sound like you come from Tijuana. That's because <laughs> I, have, I have a Sonoran accent uh, when I speak Spanish. But it's not just the phonology that can flow through. It's not just the constructions that you can pick up. Uh, uh, Elizabeth was talking about her sons who use uh, certain Scottish lexical terms because they've been living here for a long time. But you, there also seem to be certain kinds of stories you pick up. Now, the anthropologists will say, well, Mark, Coco Pelli is a trickster. And the trickster role is yeah, try, try to get how you got the trickster role out of bottom up uh, you know, perceptions. The trickster role is actually so universal that all human beings seem to have it. And Coco Pele is just each really like this level. Well, wait a minute. How, did I, I mean, do you really mean like Jungian archetypal unconscious that I was born with the idea of a trickster? That seems unlikely to me. But I was exposed in the Southwest to these stories, to these phrases, to these ways of interpreting kinds of things. And although I have no uh, experience of those things from their original contexts, I like your term. I would say, I have to make sense of what I see. And sometimes I conceive that what, I'm, what other people are doing is using ghosts of previous narratives. I have to do this when I encounter uh, the missions in California. I have to do this when I encounter the Acoma Pueblo Indian architecture. It's often architecture that gets you thinking about what could these people be. 
So in some sense, those people aren't here, but the consequences of those people whom I don't know having been here do remain. So our story would be, when you see such things, like here's a Pueblo, how do you start to conceive of it? It is often the case that you can't make sense of something without creating a role. And that's, that's the ghost. Okay, next. One more question from the audience. And, uh, I'm actually a first year undergraduate student studying biology at the University of Sanford. Were you the one who asked about machine learning? Yes, you're the one who just hired me. I'm an employee. <laughs> um, so my question today is kind of related to the previous question. So I'm intrigued in trying to understand how the physical matter in biology can bridge to our understanding of consciousness and thoughts and emotions. Like how, how does the physical bridge the theoretical? And um, yesterday we were also talking about how you were able to study autistic people and study their MRI brain scan to try to understand how they um, blend and understand the world. Notice, by the way, I don't get, I, I, I'll say this, I don't get anything out of brain scans of autistic people that shows me that they're any different from anybody else. Okay. Zip. Then could you perhaps study them as well as... Oh, we do behavioral experiments and, uh, all the time. And we do Alzheimer and and then so if you want to know about sort of medical brain imaging, that's actually an interesting area because like somebody's epileptic, they used to be you go in and do exploratory surgery and try to find the, the center because you're going to cut it out. This is really dangerous when you're ablating the, the brain to take out things. You know, you can you get it wrong, it's in, in trouble. Ablation is a very important thing. Now what they'll do with the brain imaging with the EEG and with the blood flow and so on is they're much better at picking out very precisely what's the epicenter of the epileptic fit and going like a surg surgical strike and very carefully take out just that. So on the medical side, there actually are some successes. They're mostly not cognitive, right? But when we talk about, you know, Williams syndrome, or Tourette syndrome, or various kinds of uh, things that are caused by strokes or uh, cancer, you know, the old way is you just take somebody, you observe somebody's behavior, and then when they die, they bequeath their brain to you, and then you section it, and you look at which parts of it were dead, right? That's, I mean, they're trying to get this kind of stuff forever. Now, let's go back to the consciousness. Um, this is called the hard question, and I used to be associate director of the Center for Advanced Study and Behavioral Sciences at, at Stanford, and uh, I had been a fellow there two times. And they said, Mark, you know about neuroscience and cognitive science, and when we set up this center in 1954, the year of, birth, of your birth, it's largely a center for studying human beings. So we have anthropologists and economists and, you know, invite about 40 people a year. But in 1954, neuroscience and cognitive science didn't exist. So we want to know how to select fellows to come here. Could you be associate director for a couple of years and set up that program? So I took leave from my university. I did my research and set up that program. And then I went off back to the professor. But I was at the table with these people. All here, the best people in the world. I mean, Damasio was there, but everybody else was there. Andy Clark was there. I mean, Every watching these people argue about the question you just asked, how can you go from the biological to something where there's meaning or intention or psychology? Man, that's that is the question of our age. And in fact, Chalmers has has called this the hard question. Damasio has an idea about it. Um, there's a great uh, anthropologist. Um, at Berkeley, who wrote a book called The Symbolic Species, Terry Deacon. And he has taken a crack at trying to figure out, brilliant guy, uh, knows neurobiology, knows anthropology. He's taken a crack at trying to figure it out. But you see, this is the big problem. Um, 
all of the bio, and I've been studying biology my whole life. I decided not to go on and be an MD, PhD in neurobiology. There's almost zero answer anybody has to your question. Um, also, Richard Feynman wants something I do not understand what I cannot create. And so I was wondering if it's possible in understanding blending and transferring it to um, cognitive computing and AI, in that process of trying to create artificial intelligence that's highly functioning, we would encounter problems. And then from that, would we be able to develop our understanding of ourselves better? Um. You got exact. You got your finger on exactly the pulse. When all of AI and, and and so on say, "Wait a minute, can we make computers more creative?" Because, and I don't mean like Mozart and Keats and or Sir Walter Scott, or since I'm in Scotland or whatever. I I just mean the kind of creativity that everybody has got. Got you're extremely creative. Can we make these things more inventive? just less bound to the program, where there was a symbolic programmer who had an idea of what they might encounter, tried to build it into the code, and then that's all they've got, right? Human beings are very flexible. The robots are highly inflexible. Can we just make them more flexible? Because that would be a great thing. What everybody is concentrated on is what are the processes by which you get emergent structure? What are the processes by which you get something that was somehow not built into the program. It's early days. Um, it, it, it's only recently that we have been able to try to make computer models or look at the neurobiology. So the origin of ideas has got a list of what evolutionarily could have been the processes that resulted in this kind of capacity. And there are five, five different candidates. I think all of them are probably wrong. So, but we're focus, focusing on the processes and trying to push forward and maybe you'll be the one who comes up with the right thing. On the bit about, I don't understand what I can't create, I think that's a fine bumper sticker, but of course, I hope that's not true because I try to all understand all kinds of things that I can't create like you. If I can only understand what I can, I mean, just think about that. I think just trying to, it's, blended, it's classic joint attention. This person is trying to get you to understand that if you can create it, then there's a process you could go through. And maybe now I understand it because I understand the process of creation. I think mostly people do not understand the processes of creation. What they get is the product. If you ever hung around mathematicians coming up with theorems, they just, ah, well, Right, what's going on behind the scenes in mathematical invention is largely unavailable to the mathematician, even though they came up with the proof. Once you get it, then you can say, oh, I see you do this and that and the other. But, but no, um, I, I want to represent, you know, as, uh, so here's Glenn, and I was at a conference once and somebody had tweeted, I hear that if you say blending three times, Mark Turner appears. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought, that's kind of funny. <laughs> now in the blend, they say, and so I made a slideshow of myself with Mephistopheles coming in and I, ha I had Mephistopheles from Bruno's Spouse playing in the background, right? <laughs> okay, but it's an interesting blend because it means that now I, Mark Turner, am so motivated by my demonic powers that anywhere in the world, somebody says blending three times, notice the three times that you're invoking the, the devil, um, I have the ability to hear it because of my great and to descend right there and say, aha, you would call the magic. <laughs> okay, right? So, so uh, but as, you know, Mr. Blending, I want to say these are really early days. Theory of blending has changed a number of times. It's been changed partly by me. And some of the reason it has changed is somebody like you asks a question and I start thinking about it and I think about it and I think about it and I think, you know, that person really has a point where they give me an example. Um, so the things you are asking for, we really are trying to, there are grants, there are organizations, there are groups of PhDs, there are large fundings. 
I'm trying to figure out the process so that we can do things, but also so we can teach. Because mostly what you're doing in trying to get people to understand another language or physics or biology or things like that is you're trying to put things into their minds and what are the processes to do that. So the cognitive science of teaching and learning is part of this. If we had mostly the way we do it is intuitive. If we had a better understanding of the process, then maybe we could we could do things in a better sort of way. But it's very early days. Just one last comment. Yeah. Um, so Evolutionary speaking, mm -hmm. what do you think triggered the, the beginning of our skills in blending? Because there must have been something deficient in our ability to fit the environment. And then because of this new chance development, we were able to form imagined reality with mass cooperation and give rise to politics and law and countries. So I, I've written about this again in the origin of ideas. It's a hard question. See, the, the, the big sorrow is that the National Science Foundation has not given me a time machine. If I had a science time machine, there are so many things that I, I know right where I would go and right what I would look at. The problem is I'm trying to imagine the past on the basis of, you know, brains don't survive. They rot. So there are no brains from 50,000 years ago. I mean, the best we can do is get an endocast of the inside of the skull. We say, oh, there seems to be a little bump here on the inside of the skull, it maybe, you know, uh, or you can look at genes now, because genes now, sometimes you can find records of where it came from. So you say, okay, you got mitochondrial DNA from Neanderthals, and that's from the female side. And okay, so you can, and you can do the same thing phonologically with languages. You say, these speakers speak this way, that must have been influenced because our models only allow, but it's all influential. Okay, now, how all workers on how human beings think are astonished by their imaginations because the basic evolutionary story is something survives evolutionarily only if it's fit. Otherwise, you get, if, if it costs you, you get taken out, at least statistically on, in time. Now, there are other kinds of processes, many, many, aside from natural selection and adaptation. You can have genetic drift where there is no pressure, right? So if you take uh, bacteria and um, you, and they can digest glucose, fructose, and sucrose, because that's what's in the world, and you take some of them out and you dump them into only a glucose bath and you just let them as many generations, you'll end up with bacteria that can only digest glucose because carrying around the genetic ability to do the fructose and the sucrose is a little costly. Replication, genetic replication is costly. You have to put in mechanisms to stop it from going wrong, to protect it. But if you're in an environment where there is no evolutionary cost, no cost to fitness of not being able to digest the fructose and the sucrose, then gradually it's likely to go away, right? Okay, so you don't get to say, and Darwin was very clear on this, but everybody else is very clear on that too. Oh, you want to know how human, uh, how an eye could evolve? Just give me a hundred generations, and I'll show you that at the end it's very useful because evolution doesn't care about a hundred generations now. The pressure comes down right now. Now, why was imag just don't call it blending? Say imagination, just kind of. Fantasy, kind of weird stories, think about possibilities. Why was that not possible? Why did not that not take energy away from actually getting food, replicating? Why, 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 why? And there are a lot of people who are very concerned about this because we have, once you got it, wow, well, you get everything in the world, but how could you have gotten it is exactly the question, how can you go? Well, my answer, which I've written up, is I don't have a time machine, but the, this looks to me like something where it, it goes all the way back to early mammals, maybe maybe before, but that's rudimentary blending. That was just a little, a little extra step for human beings, but it was an extra step that made all the difference. It looks the catastrophe theory and chaos theory work on cases where 
a small difference in causes has a huge difference in effects. We don't usually like to think of it that way, but that's the way the world often works. Small difference in cause, huge. So I think we're at the end of the decline, and it's just a small additional extra sort of thing. But still, how did you get that small thing? Well, I mentioned Terry Deacon. Terry Deacon, an evolutionary anthropologist, is so concerned about this that he says, listen, um, when you domesticate something, you're protecting it from pressure. So you domesticated trenches, finches, domesticated are like 22 species of domesticated finches because they have a chance to vary and it doesn't cost them. They're protected. And in the wild, you only have like five or four species of finches because the pressures are on right there. But he says human beings are self-domesticated. That is, there's a kind of fish in the Antarctic that developed essentially antifreeze in its blood. So its blood didn't freeze. That meant it could go into areas so cold that there were no other fishes. And there was lots of food, so they really existed. It was really great. And then they buried that self-domesticated. His claim is when we got enough to the point that we had skins and furs and you know some rudiments, basic primate abilities. We could then go into places where there's abundant food, no predators, we were happy, and the pressure was off. And he said, in this case, blend, learning, blend, any he, dealing with blending, but just say, you know, wild imagination, had a chance to develop without it being too costly for the individual. And once it came up, you couldn't take it away because fully robust blending was possible. Okay, so there we've been through consciousness, how does biology become attention, uh, evolution. <laughs> wow. Next. Yeah, the next question is from Nicholas, who's actually on the advisor board of I guess I'm sort of a new one. No, you can go. I want to hear your questions. Well, okay, two advisors, you have to uh, decide <laughs> yeah, who's first. first. But, uh, <laughs> we, do we have a broad? I brought a passage on um, this one thing that was uh, suggested we do is we bring some from our own work. Did you um, send did, is this? I, yeah, I did send something I, around. Well, I have hand on this one. No, it's okay. I think I've got it right time. here. This is so, blending yes. narrative and history as bodily experience. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, well, you can read it as well as I can, and everybody. Yeah, can it is impossible to give a detailed account of these combatants, right? You can exactly. So I'm just gonna this out. Excellent. So just by way of introduction, I'm Nicholas Vieta, I'm a senior lecturer of the School of Classics. Um, I work a lot on historical narratives, and um, part of this, it's not the only thing I'm interested in, but part, part of this is trying to understand how historical narratives work, and um, how they help us understand the past, because it's a, uh, it's a simplistic idea that uh, the historical narratives are about facts, that history is about facts, and that um, all historical narratives have to do is uh, be purveyors of facts and not how accurate those facts are. Um, historical narratives build trajectories between us and, and the past. They also create that past because the past doesn't exist out there. I mean, it exists in as much as people talk about it or write about it. Um, and of course, historical narratives are narratives, so they do what all narratives do. They create a whole um, multiverse of different connections with what they talk about and us. So the, um, the, one of the authors I work, uh, work on is Polybius, and this is a, a, is a passage from his histories. I'm just going to read this, and then I'll, um, I'm interested in your take on this, but I also have a couple of questions, I think, that kind of um, also came up yesterday of um, blending and other things that are interesting, um, that would be interesting to explore. So I'm just going to read this passage, it's not very long. Um, that's a remarkable passage. So uh, Polybius says here, it's impossible to give a detailed account of these combatants. These are people from the first Philip War, this working man. They could as well be from the American Civil War. Um, for just as the boxes distinguish from black and both in perfect training, when they meet in a decisive contest for the prize, continually delivering blow for blow, neither the combatants themselves or the spectators can know to anticipate every attack or every blow. But it is possible for the overall proximity of each. The determination that each was placed to get a fair idea of their respective skill, strength, and courage, so it was for these two generals. The causes of the modes of the daily ambuscades, counter ambuscades, attempts, assaults were so numerous that no writer could properly describe them. 
but at the same time, the narrative would be endless as well as unprofitable to read them. It's rather by a general pronouncement of all to men and resolved around that as a notion of the text can be in vain. So, um, just to say that this is a remarkable passage in a work that Blurvis is often depicted as this no nonsense, a lot of guy. Here we have a passage where Blurvis says a historical narrative cannot deal with this, this is too complex. Um, so instead of um, instead of giving a narrative of the things that happened, I'm producing what we would call a land. I'm inviting you to think about these events in terms of something completely different, and that's boxing match. So that's that's a complex operation because we're dealing with um, collective entities in a war. These need to be reduced to people that encounter each other, and then that needs to be put into a very specific context, which is two people fighting on a stage because that's what they do in that boxes. Um, but also at the same time, so Polybius is not giving us um, a, a narrative of these events, but he's also not really um, uh, asking us to think of a real boxing match and say, well, if you think of the last match of Mike Tyson that you saw on TV, then you know what's going on. It's even more complex than this. He wants us to draw on our experience of what a boxing match is like. And um, it takes us back to a question that, uh, that you were asking. Um, also um, yesterday. So the, the, the question is where does the whole language thing stop and when um, do we get into almost a, an intuitive way of understanding that is um, encoded in these experiences that are um, prompted, that, that we are called on, upon to recall, that was bad English, um, through the text. Um, and you know, well, how do people know about boxing matches? They might know it because they box themselves, they might know it because they watch boxing match matches, they might have read about boxing matches, or they might know from art. Um, this is why I put the little um, the photograph here of the um, famous statue, it's a thermal boxer. If, if, you, if you look at the face, you can just about see you have the here, so you can kind of start to get the obvious. Um, so, an, an, an interesting question that comes out of here is blending how does it help us understand how historical narratives work by like prompting us to, um, to draw on experiences, but not thinking of, of my Tyson of this or the, the other guy of this, but ex experiences that are encoded in the word boxing match um, and uh, prompt us to understand history not through facts, not through detailed information, but through something we have experience. And that's one of the questions I'm interested in is where do blending and an activism overlap? Because that's something that we have here in a way that you know you're supposed to um, uh, bring this up. Um, and the next question is that's linked to this, how do, how does blending emotions? Uh, how important is this? Um, because we I mean we, we do talk about language a lot, um, but we're looking a lot at images in the mind that are almost like structures of feeling. They, they conjure something up, and even if you were to explain them, you still wouldn't get the same effect as you get when, you know, somebody who has this inside them deep, deep ingrained, you say, you know, this is, think of the boxing match, think of the good shepherd, think of the Lamb of God. You can explain all of these things, but you never get the same kind of gain of them. So, as it, Longinus talks about the sublime, yeah. And arguing and giving a detailed presentation is a completely different experience from the flash of lightning yeah. that carries all before it. That's absolutely the case. Um, it's especially a case that you can believe something because like the mathematical theorem, you get to the conclusion, you say, okay, I believe that because I followed all the steps. Then next day I say, can you prove it? The answer is no, but I believe it because I've you, it's very easy to lose the argumentative steps. It takes certain kinds of training and things like that. All right. So there are some questions I won't go into, but that are awesome, like blending and emotion. Blending, uh, one of the interesting things is that blending seems to work across all conceptual domains where anybody has ever worked. This certainly has to do with the four E's of cognition, embodied, uh, extended, uh, certainly inactive and so on. But, but human beings often think by doing, right? And when you're doing, you have embodied emotions and this and that and the other, and you can use those in your blends to motivate yourself. In fact, an awful lot of your personal identity 
comes from constructing a self that has interests, that has motivation, that has ambition, that has goals, that has feelings, right? You, you do this in order to drive yourself. Right. So I talked to a surgeon once who was a cardiologist or an oncologist, and uh, she had been talking about you know, brilliance, distinguished, talking about being on the roof of the building she, when she was taking a break with this patient that she'd been working with. This, and she put out a slur of expletives, uh, a string of expletives. This, this, this thing is not going to defeat me. This tumor. She's going to get it out of there. Now, this is a crack biologist who knows perfectly well that cancers do not have intentions. They are not your foe. They're not trying to destroy you. She even knows it's not even an infectious disease where you've got the framing of something from the outside. It's your own body. Yeah. But no, she called up that by blending this pugilistic, we are, you know, come on, and we do this to ourselves an awful lot. So in my youth, I did a bunch of martial arts and a whole lot of the psychology of combat is blend after blend after blend of how to think about what the situation is, how to stay calm. And they don't just tell you the facts, they, they give you little parables essentially. Of, uh, and it absolutely changes the way. Is it the same to what we were talking about earlier also, the way in which these things help you make decisions? Yes. That's also part of also a story now because people don't often realize this, but of course these are people who drive opinion. They drive yes. they try to drive change in the pregnant. Yes. They, you know, and that's that's an interesting thing there for me as well. Indeed. And in fact, Damasio has this thing called the body loop. He says we've got it backward. Emotion is all important. Because sure, there are a few things that are um, you can sort of conclude what's going on. But mostly cognition is much too complicated to be available to consciousness. What's happening is the backstage of cognition is coming up with conclusions and it needs to communicate them to the part of you that will execute actions and make decisions. How does it do that? It puts your body into an emotional state and then you can see that, you can feel that. I am anxious, I am stressed. And now you know what you're supposed to do, right? Because it's the body loop. It's not that you, so you got this cute way of saying it. The reason you know this person makes you uncomfortable is because you recognize that you're backing away from them. It's not, this person makes me uncomfortable and I figured it all out, now I will back away. It's that you're just sort of, mm, you, your body is inactive, your body is put into a state, and now you know because you're getting the inference from that kind of thing. And the secondary body loop is when it's not actually happening to you, but you can imagine the situation which activates the body loop even though you're not in it. So you can imagine, wow, should we go to the Thai restaurant tonight? Uh, and you don't feel, feel quite right about it, and you don't sure why, right? You make these decisions. So anyway. Blending emotion, the body loop, big, 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 but I'm not going to go into that. On this bit about being able to understand large scale things, this is, we could go on for hours. Human beings can think across causation, agency, time, and space in ways other species can't. They can have an instinct that takes them to the mating field or something like that, but it's just that one thing. And they built it as an instinct. Whereas you can think about your great, great, great grandchildren, of which you have none yet and endowing them and making a trust fund and what's going to happen in climate change and what was happening in the imperial second century. You, you can think across causation, time and space, even though all you've got is this body in this thing. This is all you've got. Memory does not come winging in from the past. Your memories are right here. Your memories are biological events inside the neurons and glial cells of your brain. That's what mere memory is. You don't have access to the past. The past is not here. The memories are here now. Everything you've got is here is now. And most and all other species, except for a few instincts, work in that scale. But the human being can work across causation time, agency time and space by doing certain kinds of compressions. So here's this big war. 
it's going all over and it happened a long time ago. How are you going to figure that out? Well, you got to bring it to human scale. And the way you bring it to human scale is you take a frame that people know and maybe they have some experience of. And so this kind of compression is really, really, really crucial. So, hi, here's this war. I'm going to express it in terms of, of boxing. But you notice we do this all the time. We say Brexit. The UK has decided to uh, not be friends with the EU anymore. So here's all of the UK and all of the EU and their two people. Look at political cartoons. You will see here's the UK, here's the EU, and the UK is like thumbing its nose or something. Bring it right. At this is all over the case. Place. Look at the cover of the economists. Look at the political cartoons. Look at the, how it, politicians talk about it. They have to bring it down to something. I'll give you just a few examples. The New York Times wanted you to understand how fast Hikam El Garouche was when he set the world record in the mile. So what they did is they put the fastest milers from the previous five decades on the track. Notice, by the way, the blending. That's not a track, that's not a person, that's not Hikam El Garouche. The blend of the representation and the thing is something human beings are so good at, they don't even realize what's happening. I can stand right here and point at that and say, Hikam El Garouche here, passing the finish line. Hikam El Garouche is not here and he's not passing the finish line, but it's a representational point. Okay, so they take these five, and now Hikam El Garouche never ran against Roger Bannister. They probably never even met, but I can say, Hikam Al Garouche defeated Roger Bannister by 120 yards because in the blend, now I've got a compression. And very interestingly, the blend can inherit the linguistic constructions for the inputs, including the race. And now I can say things about the blend that are wildly false, but you know how to project them back to the input. So from the compression, you can think about the big thing and go back and forth. The blend does not replace the network. Indeed, the blend serves the network. And what's happening here is you have six different things, and this is not something different. They're all races in the mind. You're blending and you're bringing down one person from each one, and you're bringing down the winner. And now you have a kind of mythic race, and you can say things like, Hikam El Garouche beat Roger Bannister. This is now an entrenched blend. So how much would Usain Bolt destroy, beat the best sprinter of 19... 1896. So in sports talk, they just do this all the time. They want you to understand what's going across time. So they do this blend. So here are people running the 100 meter dash. These are all over the place on social media. And notice what happens down here. Hikam El Garouche has the Fiero sign, which is a sign of triumph. All the others are crying. The other seven are crying. Remember, in their input spaces, these people not only won, they set the world record. Now in the blend, they're crying <laughs> for their loss. This is emergent structure. No, it's not true of the historical thing, but now you can understand the sweep of history, uh, a catamaran trying to go from San Francisco to Boston around the Horn, in fact, was retracing the path of Northern Light, an enormous clipper ship. This is a catamaran with two guys. And we, but now in the blend, we have stuff, linguistics. We can say, as we went to press, Rich Wilson and Bill Duenga, those are the two guys on the catamaran, were barely maintaining a 4.5 day lead over the ghost of Northern Light. And there are a lot of these phrases like the ghost and the shadow and that, which indicate that this thing is really important for thinking about the blend, but it's not actually physically there, right? And I don't even have to use the ghost. I can say over Northern Light. I can go on like this for a very long time. Here's, let me just show you, give you one more compression. I'm gonna show the navigator here. Come on, show navigator, because I'm taking so much time. But you guys ask these questions that just make me so happy. And, um, but I got to show you this one uh, bit with the kids. Here we go. Uh, yeah, it was there. Just a second. Yeah. 
Okay, you want people to invest in education. Okay, that's, that's a big, long thing. It's like a war. We're talking about dealing with kids in 40 years from now, right? How do you get them to do it? How do you get them to care? These are, and, and the, and I consult with companies getting, like anybody young here who's just got a job, they don't look at their benefits. They don't look at their retirement benefits. Retirement? Are you kidding? You have to grab them and say, no, no, no. Don't just focus on the salary. You have to look at the benefits. What is, you know, what kind of support will you get? Do you get a pension? Do you have no this job? They don't want to think about it. They just don't want to think. So how do you do it? Everybody knows this is a big issue. Well, jo Joey, Katie, and Todd will be performing your bypass. Now, Joey, Katie, and Todd here are 10. They're about 10 years old. And I promise you, the one place you will never see a 10-year-old is in a surgical theater about to perform heart surgery. But there they are. And don't they look tough? And it's blended classic fine attention. They're looking at you, right? Right? You can't help but, you know, they are looking at you. And interestingly, you are both out here in the audience now. And there you are. Or at least you can blend yourself with the person. Now, are you terrified that an ignorant 10-year-old is going to be cutting into your Yes, you are terrified. So now we have emotion and we have a compression and it's right here. It's something I can understand. I don't want a 10-year-old taking a knife to my, okay, so what can I do? Well, I can educate them. And notice, by the way, it's not Joey, Katie, and Todd. Maybe I won't have a bypass and it'll be some other kids. It's not these three. Right, but from the compression, which is false, 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 false. We don't reify it. The compression makes it possible to handle, to reach up and think at big scale across things that you otherwise could not think about. And that is what I think is going on. When you look at Thucydides, when you look at Herodotus, when you look at anybody who's trying to give you the big sweep, you just can't convey it by indicating, and then this fact, and then this happened, and then, even if you look at something like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, right? In order to get you to understand it, they have to give you things to activate. The novelists do this too. You see some people, they're doing something like that. And then at one point, it occurs to you they're having an affair. So the big story comes in because they wouldn't be behaving. They're, they're behaving in a slightly odd way. Little tiny, ah, I know the story of an affair would make sense of this. That one I know. Right? It's this using these compressions and it could be real, false, imaginary. That's what I think is going on in the passage. Yeah. I just have, uh, would like you to comment. So all this is, very, is highly culturally. Of course. Bad. Yes. We didn't used to have bypasses. Yes. We don't, and sometimes we don't educate at 10 years old. The capacity for blending in a certain way is that, given by other things that inform that kind of thing. I disagree with what I think is your main point. The reason we have culture is because we have blending. Once you have blending, you can start to generate various kinds of cultural products. And as I say, it's, it's like the cultural products that you generate then will inform the kind of blending you can do. So for instance, by the way, you ought to go read A.J. Liebling's The Sweet Science, which is about boxing. The Sweet Science is boxing because he gives you these wonderful analyses of, of the great boxers and, and boxing matches that he actually saw. And what he's always trying to do is think of what the strategy was, what the character was, what this person, he's doing exactly what's in your passage, but it's not war as boxing. It's boxing, not as individual facts, but boxing as imagining the strategy and responses and emotions of these people, the sort of large scale kinds of things. Once you have certain kinds of things like you invent boxing, which is a very stylized, ritualized kind of combat, uh, you know, they, we don't box in the wild. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game, it's a cultural. Once you have that, then it becomes available as input, as gist to the kind of blending you can do. Think of like a fork and knife and a spoon. All over the world, people dine differently. You have to invent these things. Yeah. Once you invent them, then they are available as inputs for more blending. Once you invent boxing, where it's two people and a certain kind of role, then you have that available to do certain kinds of blends. But the way 
the, you have to have the blending in order to get the cultural products going. And then the cultural products serve as grist for more blending. It blends all the way down like turtles. Yeah, next. So AJ leaving the sweet science, believe me, you will be grateful. He's a brilliant writer and he's got exactly the kinds of analyses that you're looking for. And how impressed people will be when you say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm working on Polybius, Polybius, but really, if you want to understand this, you have to look at it. <laughs> well, it's 1 p.m. and uh, even I'm still here. More questions I'm, on my I, list, and I'm, I'm sorry for you. Guys, I don't want to keep you over, Michael, but I'm still here. They're both on the, our advisor board as well, so maybe I've oh, uh, got to ask lots of questions last night. So yeah, I'm okay. Don't yeah, yeah, but I, I'm not going anywhere. I have actually a commitment. <laughs> okay, bye, bye. bye. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, before we uh, end this whole, like, um, please join me. In Thanking um, Mark. You've been a great audience. I introduced you as a, um, as a professor of cognitive linguistics and cognitive science and yep. uh, a husband of a, of well a writer. writer. Yeah. You're much more than that. Uh, you were a great entertainer and the, an excellent. The construction of personal identity. And notice when you get introduced and at the conclusion, one of the things that people have to do is try to construct a personal identity for the scene in which we've just. Uh, engaged. And I always love this because I think these are wonderful blends that my mother would have loved, but she would have known that 